Oh, it's so weird. It's, you guys are just a sea of blackness. It's like I'm alone in my room. It's good. Uh, so I'm going to read you from my letter. Um, and it has pictures, but I did not plan ahead and get them projected for you. So there will be some references to the images in the text. But uh, you don't need to see them to understand it. Uh, and this is from January 19th, 2012. Dear people, I'm in an airport. That's not important. I want to tell you this. This is a picture of my grandmother in her slippers and bathrobe in her little trailer house at midnight drinking Jägermeister and telling me about how important the feminist movement was to her in the 60s. Telling me about Bella Abzug and about her mother, my great-grandma Mamie, who worked in the wool mill my grandmother only knows about some parts of my life because my mother and my aunts have sworn me to secrecy. But still, sometimes I think my grandmother is the only one who really understands me. My grandmother and Marilyn Monroe, of course. <laughs> my grandmother played the piano for money. A Nicola song, she tells me, and smiles. Mamie made a nickel an hour at the wool factory. I will tell you who taught me about style. My grandmother and Miss Piggy. <laughs> my grandmother has no eyebrows, so she draws them on with a pencil. And when I'm as old as her, I will take her advice and wear lipstick and hats every day. Once, when I was little and I didn't know that women wore makeup because my mom was a barefaced hippie, I saw my grandma's makeup table and I asked her if that was where she put on her clown face. <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> Basically, what I'm telling you is that she is the coolest. Also, she's planning for her death. My grandfather died six years ago, on January 18th. That was yesterday. But I wasn't paying attention yesterday. I was eating lunch with Mary Gateskill. My grandmother was at her church where every January 18th they dedicate the mass to him. When my grandmother is feeling lonely, she wears my grandfather's bathrobe. She's very religious, and she knows everything you're supposed to do in church, like when to touch your forehead, and when to stand up or bow, and when to say, and also with you. She knows the words to every song. No, I mean every song. Like she knows the church songs, and also she knows show tunes and also body songs from the 40s about how great it would be to be a prostitute. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> These are the lyrics. I wish I was a fascinating bitch. I'd never care if I were poor or rich. I'd live in a house with a little red light. I'd sleep all day and work all night. <laughs> Once a month, I'd take a holiday just to drive the little boys wild. I wish I was a fascinating bitch with an illegitimate child. <laughs> you can watch my grandmother sing this song on YouTube. <laughs> She says, if she had known that my aunt was filming her, she would have done more dance moves. <laughs> this is how my grandmother is preparing for her death. She is giving away all of her possessions. To do this, she uses post-its. What we're supposed to do is, when we go to her house, we write our names on some post-its and stick them on the back of anything we want dibs on. I considered some ceramic angels from the dollar store that were painted with glitter paint. But then I went with the biography of Bella Abzug and four paintings of Irish country life. The whole exercise was pretty maudlin. Afterward, we ate pizza and salted the front steps against ice. I hardly ever go to my grandma's trailer anymore because I'm a grown-up and I'm too busy to do things, and we live really far apart. It is the worst thing about being a grown-up. That and none of my friends come over and play dress-up anymore. <laughs> well, sometimes they do. <laughs> my grandma has been to college and Jerusalem, but not until after she turned 50. These are some things I said to her when I was five or less. 
I really like your toenails. What is love? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya, tomorrow. My grandmother asked me, or my grandmother said your mother will pick you up tomorrow. And that was the answer. <laughs> These are some things that my grandma has said to me. Me and Aunt Agnes are having sex on the beach. You want some? <laughs> Roses are red, violets are bluish. If it weren't for Christmas, we'd all be Jewish. <laughs> My son is gay. I wanted to tell them I have a gay son, so then I finally just said it. I really have had a wonderful life. This is the conversation I wish we could have. Grandma, I have to tell you something. I make pornography for a living. Of course you do, dear. Why shouldn't you? It's been 10 years. You must be one of those feminist pornographers I've been reading about. I knew you would understand. Yes, yes, you know what's best for you. Now go and fix us some root beer floats. Okay. But if I'm being really honest about it, it doesn't actually matter if my grandma and I ever have that conversation. She has done so many of the things that made me. She taught me how to tell a story. Never let the truth get in the way. You thought that was Mark Twain who said that, but in my memory, my grandma was the first one to say everything. In my family, there are three stories about my great aunt Katie. The first story is that her husband was beating her up until one day when her brothers came over and beat him to a pulp on the kitchen floor and after that he never hit her again. The second story is that Aunt Katie's husband was beating her up and he was spending all the money on booze until one Saturday night when he came home drunk and she hit him with a frying pan. She said, don't you ever touch me again, and he never did. The third story is that Aunt Katie hit her husband on the head with a frying pan. <laughs> My grandma would tell you that any of these stories could be true, and then she would sing you a song. It was dark when we left my grandmother's house last week, dark and cold, and she was tired, and truthfully, she seemed frail in a way that scared me, in a way that I'm not used to seeing her. And I was with my mom and my brother and my aunt, and I just kept feeling that dissonance, that desire to keep everything a secret and to simultaneously tell it all, to just be one of them instead of this strange sex worker artist person from California. I have 36 cousins. They work in a salon and a bar and a car wash and a library in the White House. Most of them are married. None of them are queer. Even though my grandmother and I grew up in very different places, I can't help this feeling that she knows me better than anyone. I wrote the second part of this letter after I'd already gotten back to California and my grandmother seems very far away again, out of reach. The plane ride back was late and turbulent and I watched a movie that made me cry because I always do on planes. In 2011, I spent 345 hours on airplanes, which is a lot of time to think and write and cry at movies. Next month, I'll fly to Berlin for our movie premiere and it will take me 22 hours to get there. I want to end this letter, but I still haven't said the thing I meant to tell you. Are you still reading this? I can't say it. I can't even tell you her name. In the rest of my life, I write an article on the train about condoms and the LA City Council, and I drink orange juice through a straw, and I wait for the lights. I visit bookstores compulsively, sometimes three in one day, and I rub silicone on my ass before I pull on the latex skirt. The truth is, I cry at movies all the time, not just on the airplane. There you go. I have no secrets. I have so many secrets. I can't even tell you my name. Love, Lorelai.